in part one of my conversation with Narada Michael Walden on Tommy Bolin. We start out with his time with Mahavishnu John McLaughlin and how that led him to his time with Tommy Bolin. And I am just so thrilled uh, to be joined today with uh, by Narada Michael Walden from your studio in San yes, Rafael, sir. right? Yes, sir. Where the magic happens. Yes, sir. You're in 2022. Yes, we are. And um, I'm just you know, so thrilled because your career has just been incredible. And there's so many aspects to your career, how you got started and you playing with Tommy back in the day and um, all the things you've done since. And, um, and also you become just one hell of an interviewer with your podcast. <laughs> oh, all right. Thank you for that, too. Just watch. You know, I, Go ahead. Yes, you, you saw my Vishnu one, right? I did. Mm, I'm, still, I'm still reeling from that. I'm still reeling from all the history and insight and things that only he could share with us because he did it. It's like, it's like, damn. You know what I mean? And he trusted you to where he would go places that I tr judge maybe he doesn't always go. Yeah. In interviews, yeah. which was yeah, we, we we spent we spent most serious history together, where he trusted me to be in his band, <laughs> uh, and so because of that, he taught me how to play with him. He taught me things I needed to know to 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 be his brother. So maybe that's a good place to start. What do you remember about the first time you uh, were asked? To come and rehearse, play, jam, whatever with the Ma Vishnu. Well, it starts like this. I first heard the music, was blown out by the music. Then God was able to get me to a show in Hartford, Connecticut, where he was playing live the Birds of Fire album in a, in a concert venue on a Sunday evening in Hartford, Connecticut. And when I got there, by God's chance, it was just he and Billy going at it guitar and drum solo and this went on for so long and so intense in some odd meter of 13 or 17 or something so strange but it was but it was just complete smoke that I, I said I have to really check out what's going on here so I got right down to the lip of the stage where I could look up in his eyes and really see what's happening his eyes were rolled back in his head and the notes were just flying like bullets out of that amplifier and loud and crisp and clear and cobbles was louder than fives crisp and clear and they were just in it and i just realized it was god it was so far beyond the mind so far what could be like fabricated made uh, uh you know uh, 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 memorized any of that world no it was just streams of consciousness and it went up for so long i was like this is what i have to do I realized this is what I have to do. And so I was able through God's grace to get backstage that night with him. A, a, a picture was his name. He, he had mercy upon me. And he got me backstage because I said, I really want to meet Mahavishnu. And I went backstage and Mahavishnu said, wait in this little room. I waited in the little room and he, and he came in and his accent just kind of threw me off because he, he sounds like a black English cat mixed together, <laughs> you know? And, and here he is in all of his glory and his sweat still coming off his face. And I said, my name is Michael Walden, and I, I want to be like you. I've never seen anything like it. And he said, well, it's because of my prayer life, my meditation life that's, you know, in, inspiring me. I said, I, I know I can tell on the back of your albums are these poems by your guru. He said, yes. He said, I'm going to see the guru at 6 in the morning in Queens, New York. So it hit me. After this massive show he's just played, now he's talking to me about 1 in the morning, He's going to drive all night back to Queens to see his guru at 6 in the morning. means he's not going to sleep. <laughs> That's when I realized that it was, it was even more than I thought. So then about a week later, he calls me and says, I want you to come meet the guru. I can't be there tonight. The guru is going to be in, in Norwalk, Connecticut. I want you to go meet him. And then the fact that he would call me at all was just mind-blowing. I said, okay. So I hung the phone up. I knew disciples didn't have long hair at that time, so I brushed my hair back, shaved my little beard off, put on a little white clothing, and had my friend Greg Fell in his big black limousine take me down to the meditation hall. And when I got there, there was room on the girl's side for me to sit down. I sat down with the girl's side, and the guru was singing this beautiful song. Beautiful song. He kind of looked at me, but he kept singing this beautiful song. 
And then not long after that, an old lady named Akuti got up and she started reading a book of poetry called The Dance of Life Part Two. And in this book would be like poems of longing for God. Like, oh Lord, how much longer must I cry be before I will see your face? H how many tears must I cry before I'll see your face? It went on like this. Every poem was of crying, of longing. And that's what hit me again. Am I really ready for this? I, I want, I asked for it, but am I really ready for it? So then after, after this meditation, Guru said to go upstairs into the library and look around for the books. Maybe you can buy a book or just see the, all the books we put together. So I went upstairs to the book and there was a black disciple there named Lelehan. He was very kind to me and he was really cheerful. He said, come on, come with me, come with me. So I went with Lelehan. We went upstairs. I had just enough money to buy that book they read from The Dance of Life Part 2. I bought the book, came back downstairs, and there's the guru standing there, very peaceful. And he starts to meditate on me, kind of cl closing his eyes. I saw John McLaughlin with his eyes up in his head like this looking at me. And this went on for maybe five or ten minutes. And then he said to me, you are Mahavishnu's friend. I said, yes. He said, you would like to become my disciple. I said, I think I'm ready. And then he kind of smiled, this beautiful smile. He said, I accept you within my heart. And then he kind of like walked away. But as he walked away, I felt like a kind of explosion of gratitude in my heart that I was now accepted by Mahavishnu John McLaughlin and his teacher. This, this was a big to-do for me, some little boy from Kalamazoo, Michigan. <laughs> So then I was asked to come down to that meditation hall once a week to pray, meditate, and kind of learn. And I did. And then Mahavishnu would call me periodically just to come become friends. And then he said, come down to my restaurant in Queens. A few months, I went down there. And the first thing we actually played together would be on his guitar case. There were no drums there. He played acoustic guitar, and I would play in seven or some, some odd meter he liked on his guitar case. And the fact that I could do that showed him that I had some talent. Then, a few months later, at, after the Norwalk meditation uh, let out, he came to, to the meditation, Mahavishnu, and said, let's go next door. There's a little, little drum kit over there. Uh, a disciple, I forget his name now. Um, I should know it, but it's, it's escaped my, my mind. It was a little white drum kit in there. So we went down in the basement, and Vishnu plugged in, and that was actually the first time we really played together. And I was astounded by, again, the clarity and the power. And the, and the ease in which he played. You know, I've, I've played a lot of guitar players, even at that time in my life. In Kalamazoo, Michigan, there's a bevy of great musicians, a bevy of great guitar players, a bevy of great drummers, everything's in Michigan. But Vishnu was just like, um, you know, when you hit a pedal on the gas pedal and it just goes. <laughs> That's how it was with him, just like the, the greatest of ease. And so I was like taken aback how that felt. Okay, I gotta, I'm, I'm, almost, I'm almost telling this, this, this great story. Then I, was, then I went on to, to another concert of theirs in Tanglewood. And they played outdoor concert in Tanglewood. And now this time, I'm taking it back as outdoors, how now Jan Hammer is on the synthesizer, so loud and so clear, spitting back the lines to Vishnu that, that Vishnu would play back to him with the greatest of ease. And they're kind of going at it now. That was a new, a new thing. I was like, wow. And Cobham is doing his thing. So, so beautiful. Oh, my God. So I watched this show, and there's a piece they play called Sanctuary, which is so heavy and so deep and so beautiful and so dr dramatic with its quiet parts. And then it gets so loud. And it gets so soft again. So after this show, I go back to the upstairs area where they are, and this, this time I get a chance to meet Billy Cobham for the first time. I touch his hand. I couldn't believe how soft his hands are. Like baby. All the power and fire that comes out of that man. His hands are like baby's hands. It's like, oh my Lord. These people are another, another world. And so then Mavish says, you live not far from here. I said, I live in um, Canaan, Connecticut. He said, take me there. He put his double neck guitar in the back of his, his, his rental station wagon, whatever it was. He said, drive the car. Now, I barely know this man. I'm driving the car to my house with him. And then he falls asleep in the front seat. So I'm really on my edge that, that I know what I'm going, I'm, I know what I'm doing, I'm, I'm in charge of his guitar, of him. And when we get to the house up there and, and, and way out in the woods, way out in the woods, 
It's a main big house and four of the little cabins and then a barn. The barn we, we transformed into a big studio. But when I get there, I run in the house. I said, fellas, you're not going to believe who's here. I tell Sandy Tarano, who's the, the guitar player, the Billy Higgins, the piano player, Ralph Armstrong, the bass player, who's there, Greg DeJoven, the our, our roadie, and Greg Fell, our, our sponsor, our manager. Bob Vishnu's here, you guys. Get ready. <laughs> and in he walks in the house. And people was like Abraham Lincoln walked in the house. <laughs> incredible and he's so beautiful as you know and so then we made him some dinner and we sat down and we just had a nice conversation the next morning we go into my little cabin and he wants to meditate with me and then that's where i have another classic story because now um it's like wooden wooden floors i have a little picture of guru and some flowers and then halfway through the meditation i can hear what i think i might have left my faucet on because i can hear the little Little drops like that. I'm thinking, I hope I'm not disturbing him by my, my faucet, my leaky faucet. And then he, after a while, he kind of bends over to pray and go down like this. And I do the same thing. And then when I come back up, I look at him to kind of look at him. And that's why I see what's happened. It's all flooded. His whole face is flooded with tears. It was the sound of the teardrops falling <laughs> on the wooden floor that made that sound. And then I'm realizing again, am I ready for this? Because here's this man I adore completely wow. in another world. So then he says, let's go play. We go across to the barn, and in the barn is Ralph Armstrong on bass, Sandy Trano, this great guitarist with our band called the New McGuire Sisters. He's genius. And this cat from, from Detroit on keyboards named Billy Higgins. And, and he's got it all wired up with the, the roads going through the ring modulator and all that kind of sound. And we're going at it. We're playing really fast funk, the way we know that Vishnu likes that fast, that fusionary world. <laughs> and then he lets everybody solo first. He wants everyone to solo first, you know, and he sits on a kind of high chair with his double neck. And then it's time for him to play a solo. And then the weirdest thing happens. He kind of turns toward me. Like, like, you, you being the camera would be me. And he puts his face on like a stone. But the sound that comes out is burning fire. Every note, precise, incredible. But to look at his face would be like this. Then I said, Narada, don't you blow you, don't you blow this opportunity. I said, I closed my eyes. Because if I had looked at him, he, 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 he could have thrown me off. I wasn't ever used to that. I'm used to cats, like, you know, you see Hendrix. You know, all the fire and the other face, the, the, like a boxer, all the emotion. He was doing the opposite. So I closed my eyes. Then I realized that I could just go by the sound and I could, just, I could play and get, get out there with him. I'm so glad I did that because then it, it went. <laughs> and then not long after that, you know, we became friends even more so. I moved down closer to the, to, to the center. I lived with a guy named Purushottama at his house, who was another great disciple. And the Mahavishnu would call me every now and again, let me know what's going on with his life and, his, and the Mahavishnu Orchestra Band. And we became more friends. And then not long after that, it would be like December of 73, I got a phone call. He said, I'm in, I'm in Puerto Rico with Guru, and I want to know, would you join my band? I'm going to start a new, or, new Maravish Orchestra in the top of the year, and I'll come in January of 74 and get with you, and then I will teach you to play with me. And I was completely blown away by that. Yeah. And then he did. In the January, he came to my little basement where I played with a band called Jatra. They were a band of disciples. And then he would come downstairs, and he would say, just listen to me. I said, okay. And then he'd play in seven or nine or 11. And then he'd play these long cat and mouse games where he would not give me a one. And he would say, don't you give me a one either. So I had to learn to be able to feel what he would call in odd rhythms. He would say, feel the, feel the cycle. Feel the cycle of it. Feel the cycle. Don't have to always count it. Just feel the cycle of it. So then I could kind of latch onto that. But he was a master at, at kind of knowing where the downbeat was so he would avoid the downbeat and play everything but the downbeats on purpose. So that's how he taught me. Then he would start writing these compositions. Uh, the first one would be called Hymn to Him, H-Y-M-N, Hymn to Him, H-I-M, to God. And then he put the band, he said, you bring your bass player, Ralph Armstrong. You bring your keyboard player, Gail, Gail Moran, who played with the, with the Jatra band and sang beautifully. You bring her, and then I'll bring Jean-Luc Ponty. And then we'll start, we'll start a new band, and let's go up to uh, Michael Tilson Thomas' place in Buffalo, New York, and get him to get him to do the strings, and we'll do Him to Him live. So we did Him to Him live in Buffalo, and that was phenomenal, with a full orchestra, playing that great piece 20 minutes long. I'm telling you, I, I never lived until that happened to me. 
and we're wearing tuxedos, like a real <laughs> classical event. Wow. And then he, and then not long after, he said, "Okay, now I'm going to make a plan for us to go to London to record with the Beatles producer George Martin <laughs> and the Beatles engineer Jeff Emmerich in maybe April of of this year, and I'm going to do the same type of thing him and him with Michael Hudson Thomas conducting the London Symphony, and I'll write five more pieces." And then he got with Mike Gibbs, the great string arranger, to actually arrange all those pieces. And then he would grace me by giving me like a little Fender Rhodes and him humming the melodies of those songs so I could learn them. And then we had like a, a two or three days in SIR in New York to actually run them through, which I'm glad we did because <laughs> they were complicated pieces. They, I mean, I'm telling you, they were complicated pieces. Duh. And, and then he wants you to improvise, <laughs> and you know, like you like you know them all your life. Yeah. So I'm glad we were here rehearsed. So when I got to London, at least I had an idea yeah. of what was expected of me. Wow. And then when we got to London, George Martin put me in the same room with the strings. There was there was okay. Here's London Air Studios. There's a main studio that was huge with a whole symphonies in there. They put me in there, and then we started playing. And my drums are so loud. He says, "No, this is not gonna work. I gotta move you across the hall into a small room." So I go in the house, a small room. Then in the small room, I'm in an encagement with a string, with a with a with a, a TV camera, a TV, so I can see Michael 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 Tizen Thomas conducting the orchestra, and a camera on me. And here's Mavi Shnu, Ralph, Gale, and Jean Luc Ponty in the same room with me. So then we start cutting, and I'm relying upon looking at what the strings are doing across the hall, which is quite complicated. But we 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 did it because I'm watching Vishnu, and he knows the music. I kind of halfway know the music. Ralph Armstrong's genius, Jean Luc Ponty, Gale, we're all together. And then George Martin himself was so beautiful. He was just like, this sounds fabulous. This is really coming together. And then we go, we go into the main uh, control room to listen to the playbacks. And it'd be like heaven in there. Mike Gibbs would be like, oh. the sound of the strings and then the drums and then Vishnu and all that coming together. It was like, oh. so that's kind of how the experience kind of unfolded. Every day would be like that kind of. You know, heavenly experience of these great compositions coming to coming to life, and and George would be like just encouraging and uh, never like negative. For example, I would ask him. I would say like, I love what you did with Ringo on the on the phasing of the symbols with the Beatles. Can you phase my symbols? He would say, No, we can't do that. You know, because we've already done that. And I would go, oh, Okay, he's already done that. He has already done that. So I have to kind of rethink my change my thinking and to kind of just go with whatever you wanted to do, which is very natural. He wanted me to be very natural. And it all worked out beautifully. And then, for example, he would say to Gail Moran on a song called Smile of the Beyond, he would say, Gail, put these headphones on, go in there and sing the song through, make sure the headphones sound good, you know? And then after you do all that, then we'll do a, do a take. She goes and she sings the whole song through. She comes and she says, yes, they sound beautiful. They say, I, hear, I hear myself. And he would say to her, that was it, Gail. What you just sang, not even knowing I was recording you, that's the record. <laughs> so th I learned those type of tricks from, from him, he would, you know, do, to take the pressure off you. And then things like this, Jeff Emmerich, the great engineer, he would say, when Paul McCartney was recording his bass, he would say, Paul loved the sound and we loved the sound of Motown records. And it killed us that we could not get the same sound as Motown got. We thought we might even be down to, to the voltage of America voltage against the UK voltage, why we couldn't get the same sound. Of course, I never said, well, you know, that was James Jameson playing that bass <laughs> in Detroit. It's <laughs> <laughs> his own spiritual vibe there in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> and James Jameson was one of the teachers for Ralph Armstrong, who was 17 years old playing with us. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just like, you know, man, I'm, 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 I'm letting you have it, man. This is, it, was, it was phenomenal. It was just phenomenal. So I'll, I'll go ahead. Then we make a we, we tour behind the apocalypse. Then we make a, a second album called Visions of the Emerald Beyond in Jimi Hendrix's studio in in Greenwich Village, New York. And then this piece again, Vishnu gave us me little demos so I could learn the uh, Visions of the Emerald Beyond, uh, Eternity's Breath, uh, Can't Stand the Funk, Faith. Those pieces that were really, really beautiful. And that was Ken Scott now engineering, who another Beatle white white album. And Spectrum. And, Jimmy, and here Spectrum. I am. At, at this, this my drum set up where Mitch Mitchell sat. So I'm like, in heaven, and then this time I'm a tiger, because now I feel confident we've toured together, we've, you know, we've broken the ice together, so that's why on that album, on that second album of where I'm playing, I just really felt so confident and happy that I'd found a home with, with this great teacher, Mahavishnu. Wow. Mm-hmm. And then, so I'm just going to zoom so that you don't understand with Mahavishnu how I got to Tommy. Tommy, I would start meeting now up at Nat Weiss's office, who was Mahavishnu's manager. And I said, I know you. You're from that band called Zephyr. 
We all knew him by Zephyr Michigan. That's how bad he was. I mean, there's, there's lots of rock, rock bands, rock bands, rock bands, rock bands, rock bands. But he was so badass with Zephyr that I knew about him. And then, of course, he started making his name with Billy Cobham and Spectrum coming up. With Ken Scott Engineering. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then, so then it came time, after our last Mavi Schnur Orchestra album, Inner Worlds, after I do the Wired thing with Jeff Beck, and I do a thing with um, a few other, you know, jazz, jazz Rock Fusion Worlds hot with all kind of folks happening. Then I was asked in New York, what I, Tommy said, come down and cut a jam at Jimmy's place again. Here I'm back setting up again in the same spot I did the second album with Mavi Schnur Orchestra to do a song called Marching Powder. And we cut Marching Powder live. And here's Jan Hammer, who I never had played with in a studio before. Here he is. Here's Sammy Figueroa on Kungas. Here's uh, Stanley Sheldon, I believe, was on bass. Here's, here's David Sanborn on live alto sax. Here's Tommy, rare form. Here's, I think, on engineering, might have been Dennis Mackay. Dennis Mackay, yep. So here we all are in a live setting. We, we learned the song. We cut it. I think maybe we cut it just twice. Probably they end up using the first version, though. But anyway, it was on fire. Tommy was happy, everybody was happy. And it was so much happiness, which I resounded to, like the same with my vision, he was happy, that Tommy said, well, I might go on a tour. And maybe, would you would you want to come play with me? I said, I'd love to play with you. Look for parts two and three. There's 40 more minutes of Nara to Michael Walden on Tommy Bolin.